there we've got two aircraft repair facilities and we also have a business that's trying to uh, get into the aircraft manufacturing business. They've been trying for several years but with the economic downturn there just hadn't been a market but they're really hoping to get something started here really soon. They're, they're ready to go. They just need uh, uh, some customers to buy their airplanes and are ready to start, to, well, as I call it, bending, bending metal. We have a new business coming to our region that we don't have, and they've asked that I kind of keep it quiet, uh, that they are already got facilities out there and they're hoping to be running by the middle of May, and I, and I think y'all will be uh, uh, both impressed and uh, glad to have this service at our airport. Uh, but uh, as I said, I'll let them do their, their public announcement. I told them I would help them get uh, TV coverage and newspaper coverage when they're ready, ready to announce. I think they'll have an open house sometime in May. Um, the, uh, uh, Advanced ATC, as I said, they, they're out there, and uh, uh, Dexter's trying to sneak in. There's Representative Sharper, uh, just walked in. Um, the um, uh, Advanced ATC is actually, they're very entrepreneurial, so they have sent letters to all the airports where the towers are, have been announced for closure, offering their services as a tower control service or whatever. And, and so I've gotten calls once or twice a week now since this announcement came out about them operating other towers, what we think about them and things. So it's, uh, it's, it's fairly interesting. But like I said, it is a, a private company. Last little thing about the airport is that, that I kind of like, I say that I'm responsible for everything and in charge of nothing. Okay, so I've got five people full time and our job is to make the airport safe for everybody else to operate in. I'm very much like the mall manager. I want all the stores to be rented out, to be selling things and everybody be happy. But you know, I'm responsible for keeping the floors clean and the bathrooms clean and that sort of thing. And the yard, you know, the, the grass cut and the birds away and that, that, that type of stuff. So um, all those other businesses are all independent. Uh, and independently run. We have connections through them through leases, and there is a clause in the lease that says if they're, you know, they, like especially the people like the car rental places or whatever, if they've got people that are have just terrible customer service skills or whatever that could be construed as a violation of their lease agreement, we could take action through that. But by and large, they're all independent businesses that operate out there. Okay. With that, I'll be glad to take any questions that you may have or expand on anything. Yes, sir. No, maybe, um, let me explain this. They're, they're only interested in, in controlling. They're not interested in training anywhere else at this point. Because um, what, what they're looking for is a couple things. One is uh, your, your training programs only be as good as your placement program. And so people that are going to come here, and it costs $50,000 for a young man or young woman to go through that program. It's a year-long program. And it, so you spend $50,000 and come out on the other end and not have a place to go to, to, you know, to place. So what they're doing now, and I can't speak for the company, I can only speak for the people who have been asking me. What, what people have asked me for is that they have come, come to them and approached them that they would keep the same controllers that are in the tower, but uh, to change the, uh, the business scheme or the business arrangement that they have that's currently with the FAA, to change it and with like say in one airport I think Federal Express is interested in paying because it, it's a vital interest to them to keep that tower open. And then another one, it was just the, it's the city of Tuscaloosa, Alabama is considering taking that themselves instead of taking the federal money and paying that. And then, so these guys would be the management company to manage the controllers that are currently in there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. We, we peaked, we had a 10 year high. I went back and looked, we had a 10 year high in uh, two years ago, in 2010. It, we had 42,003 people depart our airport to go out. Our capacity is about 50,000 seats. So it's actually a pretty good, you know, we, you know, if you do the math and percentage, when one person counts as 2% on an airplane of 50 seats, that's actually pretty good. We do have spare capacity. You know, so we've got, you know, 8,000 empty seats, but there may not be where you want, at the time you want them. You know, they're typically at the flight that leaves about now. It's typically when it has the empty seats. I've seen it tick down a little bit, but not a whole lot, um, uh, which we're grateful for. Um, 
because that is what, you know, when people say, hey, what's it going to take to get another flight or what's it going to take to get another airline, it's when we max out what we have because the airlines are all about numbers and things and they look on there and they go, oh, they're packing, the, they're packing those planes out at, you know, 90 plus percent every flight. We need to put some more capacity in there by either making the aircraft larger or adding some more seats on another flight. Um, but it's just a slight downturn, but uh, we're not too far off. We're roughly 40,000 uh, per year in employment and about the same numbers coming back in. So roughly 80,000 80, folks. And if it's been a while since you've been out at the airport, we've got a subway restaurant in the terminal building now. And believe it or not, we have an ATM machine in the terminal. That was the second most asked question out there. The first one was, where's the restroom? The second one is, where's the ATM? So well, we have an ATM out there now. Okay. What other questions might I answer? Yes? I, I asked Delta about that. They're very cordial, but here's their answer. Why would we want to send somebody anywhere else than Atlanta? Because from Valdosta, you're one connection away from 164 nonstop destinations around the world. And I said, well, some people, it's a little hectic in Atlanta. They don't necessarily want to connect there. They like to go someplace that's a little bit, you know. They're very cordial, but that's kind of where they are on that. It's just, uh, it's, that's, that's their mecca, if you will. I don't mean to offend anyone, but that's their big, that's their big hub. And that's what they're designed to do is bring those things in there to feed their mainline airplanes to go out to those 164 destinations around the world. Yeah, uh, yeah. See, once again, I'm the mall manager. You know, um, I let them know that we watch things because we discuss airfare comparisons at our monthly meeting. And if something starts getting out of whack, I actually send it to them. Do they do anything about it? I don't know, but at least they know that we're watching. Okay, uh, and then uh, they also have people that look and see. They have a window of time and they'll have the number of connecting flights. And there's some kind of data, like I said, they're kind of data geeks on all this kind of stuff. Say, okay, the 5.45 in the morning, within two, two hours of your arrival time, you've got 200 flights that you can connect to or something like that. So they kind of look at all that and they adjust the times from time to time. I wish they would tell us when they're adjusting the times, but some, so we just have to find out ourselves a lot of times. Uh, one thing I will say, uh, about that we, where we do try to encourage folks to fly out of Valdosta is on our website, which is www.flyvaldosta.com. We have a new little widget on there. It says uh, a travel cost calculator. And if you click on that, you, you can compare um, the, the total cost of flying out of Valdosta versus, uh, uh, I think it's Orlando, Tampa, Tallahassee, Jacksonville, and Atlanta. And what it does is uh, you put your ticket price in in, Valdo uh, in Valdosta, which granted, oftentimes it's higher than some other places but we don't charge for parking, okay? And we have free Wi-Fi while you're waiting. And then uh, if your time is worth something, you just fill in the little blanks and it assumes your car gets 20 miles a gallon. You put in whatever the, ga the price of gas is today or whatever, and then it throws in a nominal charge for parking. In other words, if, like say Atlanta, where they have parking anywhere from say $8 a day to $22 a day, it'll pick something in the middle, say 12 or $14 a day to give you an idea. And then it does the math for you. It tells you how much it's gonna cost in gas and in parking, and if your time's worth something, how much that is. So the bottom line says, okay, it's $399 out of Valdosta, and your ticket out of Atlanta is 305 but by the time you add all those other things, it's actually cheaper to fly out of Valdosta. And the nice thing, to me anyway, it's not when you're leaving because you're excited. It's when you get back and you go, okay, now i got a three and a half hour ride staring me in the face or in the case of Jacksonville, two hours. Now, I completely understand we don't have the same capacity that's leaving those airports and capacity and competition is what drives some of those fares. And so you can, you know, I don't blame you. We're all consumers. But I would encourage you to use that and uh, try to get a good, honest apples and apples comparison uh, to your, your, your cost of flying. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's for the airport authority staff. So it's myself, and we have a lady that uh, uh, manages the money in our operating account. Then I have an operations supervisor, and then two maintenance guys. And the maintenance guys, they're kind of jacks of all trade. They do everything from landscaping to working on the runway lights to other minor repairs. Um, let's see, we have one of the maintenance gentlemen is minority. Uh, we have 
two minority individuals in the part-time positions, but one of them's filling two positions. So we normally have three people, but she wanted to work seven days a week uh, so uh, in her part-time job. So there's uh, three, and then we have three, we have three white males, two white females, and so six or four of positions are filled by minority individuals. Yes, sir. Um, well, believe it or not, the number one travel destination out of Valdosta is Las Vegas. I would have never have guessed it. I would have never guessed it. And then, and then shortly after that, it was Baltimore, and I can understand that because a lot of the military fly to catch their rotators over to uh, Afghanistan out of Baltimore, so they, they leave out of here. Um, we have a lot of business people that come in. A lot of businesses have businesses here that are satellite operations of their headquarters, such as you know Lowe's Distribution, Home Depot, uh, that sort of thing. SAFT, I've seen some SAFT folks over there on the commercial side. On, on, the, uh, on the general aviation side, Martin's Bakery uh, has aircraft that come in and out. Uh, we also have um, Archer Daniel Midland comes in. A lot of the big agricultural firms uh, bring their aircraft in. Um, there's, uh, I've even seen the Cleveland Browns. Supposedly the Cleveland Browns football team owns a chain of convenience stores in our area. I don't know if it's Flash Foods or what, but I thought they were in talking to Greg Reed the other day, gonna you know draft him to, for the Browns, and I found out they were here to visit convenience stores. Um, but they had a very nice aircraft that comes in. Uh, and then there's about 55 aircraft that are based here, uh, of which um, about 10 of those are pretty much just strictly business aircraft, and then the rest of them are kind of a combination of business and, and pleasure. Uh, aircraft that uh, that come that come in and out. Uh, we've noticed uh, a, where you were asking about the passengers, not so much of a downtick in the passengers, but we have seen a considerable downtick in the number of aircraft operations. In other words, other people coming in and and whatnot. Uh, I don't really have any uh, an answer for that, other than just the overall economic situation that people are trying to find uh, cheaper ways to travel. And unfortunately, sometimes it's an impression thing uh, that people have. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll take Martin's Bakery, for example. One of their, you know, we're talking about the tower earlier, I was. One of their requirements was to be near an airport and also an airport that had an uh, operating control tower. And so uh, they're a fairly well-paying uh, group right there, right by the airport. They're on Old Clyteville Road. Uh, and they're, they're a very good tenant at the airport as well. Um, the takeoffs and landings, but the fuel cells, believe it or not, have not really changed that much. Just the numbers of takeoffs and landings. So I, um, I don't really have an explanation there. Um, but uh, we have, uh, about two years ago, uh, we built uh, some new hangars, uh, 10 new T hangars and six new corporate hangars. Um, the company I referred to earlier that's coming in has rented one of those corporate hangars, so we have five more we're ready for. If some, a business wants to come here and has an airplane, um, we're ready for them. There won't be a waiting list or have to figure out how to build one or anything. We're, we're ready to go, ready to go out there right now. Okay. What other questions might I answer? I have yes. Um, the airport has a lot of open land around it. Would it be possible to build a solar array on that open land? Believe it or not, I had a guy that was, he, he was supposed to come down three times uh, about, uh, specifically about a solar array. Uh, we pay about $10,000 a month for our electricity bill out there. And I was looking for, to recoup some of that somehow. So I said, you know, I'm looking for about $1,000 a month. I can get about a 10% return, you know, to offset our electric bill. I would think it would be a good thing you could use the land. And uh, he called and canceled once, and he rescheduled and canceled again. And then he called and said, and Joyce, don't take this wrong. I don't mean it because I don't have the information. He said something about trying to work out something with the property tax in this area with what he was trying to do. And, uh, because uh, I, uh, I brought that up, and my wife Renee thinks South Georgia ought to be the, the solar capital of the world because we got so much of it, you know. Um, and uh, so I haven't given up on it, but I can't really, ha I can't get the guy here, you know, he just won't come. Okay, well, I know a different guy, so I'll, I'll tell you something. <laughs>
Yeah, um, uh, and these guys have a track record. They put uh, two phases in at the Chattanooga Airport in Tennessee, uh, and they, they believe they're, they've got some sites here in Georgia, because Georgia Power is doing a, a big project buy and a small project buy, and this was going to be one of the small project buys, and I think you had to have a number of each of these to be competitive in that, that thing that Georgia Power is doing. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Speaking as an observer of the industry, do you think that it is inevitable that they will start charging passengers by pound? Oh, that's way out of my lane. I, I, uh, I, I would, I would hope not. I, um, I mean, is it by a pound that you stand on a scale, or by a pound of luggage? You know, because already, you know, they already charge. Uh, extra fees for uh, for heavy luggage. I, I, I would I would hope not. Uh, I will tell you that since I started flying, it used to be that you would calculate the average weight of a passenger. If you didn't know, you just when you're calculating, it was 170 pounds, and that's moved to 200 pounds now um, for their weight and balance. But I I I, uh, I don't. That's that's an airline that's an airline question that I don't even want to touch. I mean, because any time there's any issues like that, you see it immediately makes national headlines. You know. So yes, sir. Yes. Oh, you're oh, okay. I can't help you with that. <laughs> Anything more for me? Otherwise, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, remember the sports thing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jim. Now, uh, Jim and his wife have another appointment that they have to go to, so they're going to dash out of here. But we are super lucky because we have Representative Dexter Sharper here with us, and he's going to give us a little bit of a legislative update. So, Dexter. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I hope you all feel relaxed, because I'm, I'm going to have to be relaxed. I've been running all day. And um, actually, last uh, Friday, um, I basically came home. Uh, we finished midnight on Thursday of last week in session. Um, I think we, have a, we had a very good session, uh, especially on the Democratic side. Uh, the majority of Republicans, they didn't beat us up too bad. But I think... Um, First of all, I'd like to thank everybody that had to take into voting for me to let me become state representative. I'd like to thank the commissioners here, uh, Demarcus and Miss Joyce. I appreciate y'all being everywhere and being that voice uh, for the county. And you know, I don't know if y'all know it or not, but when it comes down to this area, we have some good elected officials, especially uh, on the local area. And a and number one thing is the county commission. Uh, they stayed close in and being involved and you guys made the trips you know, up to Atlanta and that, and that means a lot when our elected officials from the local come up to Atlanta and also you that came to the bird supper and uh, other you know, different things going on. I really appreciate that because when you're away from your city for almost three months, you like to see some familiar people and that was a big plus. And uh, thank Jarrell my uh, legislative aide here, who I'm glad we connected through somebody else's campaign, but he was able to be a part of what we're doing, so I appreciate that. Uh, but to get you up on speed a little bit, when we're talking about the Republican Democratic size up there, for the most part, we worked on things together. Uh, that's one thing I've learned, that when it comes down to the real needs of the people, they tend to work together. Uh, there are other issues that I'm proud of, uh, that were kind of democratic issues that came from my part was when we're talking about the HOPE scholarship and HOPE grant, okay? On the HOPE grant side, which deals more with technical education, we were able to drop the GPA requirements down to 2.0 instead of 3.0. And what happened is in the past, we had a lot of people dropping out because, you know, when you're in technical education, most of those students, they have full-time job, full-time families, some another part-time job, and you're trying to go to school. So you can't maybe hit that 3.0. And when you, when, you, when you get to a point where you can make the 2.0, you're in a better position to help your family, and you can come up to the next level so you can be more productive in your society. And a lot of jobs that we were looking at, uh, especially truck drivers, 
there's over 5,000 shortage uh, positions in just truck driving. So if we can get more people into the technical side of things, as far as um, the, the and I, does everybody understand that the Hope uh, Scholarship and the Hope Grant are two different things? Okay, just remember the grant has to do with technical things like that, and the uh, good thing, and um, the scholarship has to do more with your university. So we were able to work hard, and uh, we got that passed through the House, and it won't be a problem through the Senate because the governor was a part of helping us get that done. Another thing I would say that really helped on our end is when we were able to get that um, deterrent act of people being able to drop out at 16, they're going to be moving that up to 17. So that's a big thing uh, that's going to make these kids, because what happens when you're 16 and you get out of school, you know, you, you drop out, you're not going to really do much more of anything because you have to be a certain age a lot of times to get into technical college. Okay, so even at 16, you're dropping out, and the only thing you're looking for is getting in trouble. But if you're at least 17, and you say, well, school's not for me, I couldn't get it, but then now you have the freedom, and get a GED or whatever you need to do, and then you go to technical education, and therefore they say, well, maybe I'm not college material, <laughs> but I can do technicals. A lot of people are good with their hands, and so I think that was another thing that worked out for us. Um, Another thing that we were very concerned that really didn't go our way as much is, you know, the governor not accepting, you know, the Medicaid expansion. And, you know, that would have really helped about over 600,000 people that are in a position to get Medicaid that they won't be able to get it right now because of the expansion wasn't signed. However, we worked hard and let them say, hey, look, this is something we really want, and we did a few different things, you know, in the session to let them know we didn't really appreciate them not signing, him not signing. So, but in the meantime, we had uh, maybe 150,000 people that will still be able, out of the 600,000, with the budget and everything that we did, now you still have about 150,000 people to, you know, take